so you'll see a few things in here that still say HP2, um, but we are working on rebranding and getting it to the HP2, uh, the Smart Scale look and feel. So um, welcome to Smart Scale. Any questions before we get going? All right. So just a very quick summary of some of what we've seen over the round one. We had 321 applications submitted last year. Um, of that, 131 entities actually submitted applications. Um, it was a total of about $6.95 billion of HB2 or Smart Scale Fund requests. Um, the other funding uh, was equal to 6.2. So obviously, our um, needs always exceed the actual funding we have available, but um, pretty significant volume. About 84% of those projects were uh, identified as highways as that principal improvement type. Um, of the 321 that were submitted, 287 actually were advanced to scoring. And um, I'll talk a little bit more, but uh, of the 287, 163 were funded, selected for funding in the recent update of the six-year program. So here's a quick summary of kind of the number of, of applications that were submitted by district. The volume, the dollar value that I just indicated for the smart scale. And then the last column is the total funding that represents both the smart scale funding and any other allocations or other committed funds um, identified for those projects. So really 13.17 billion in needs. Just kind of uh, summarizing what we saw, we saw about um, 55 applications that were submitted for the statewide grant program, grant program. 98 of those were submitted for the uh, district grant program, and about 168 were submitted for both grant programs. Um, and then just the distribution by the VTRANS needs as they were submitted. So with round one, we funded um, 8.33, actually a total of 1.7 billion in requests. And this just gives the distribution for the um, district grant program with our percentages by district. This, this is a great slide. I think it just summarizes a lot of really good information as a result of round one. We have the distribution of the high priority and the grant funds by district and by fiscal year. We also have the number of projects by, um, this just kind of shows distribution as far as how many projects got funded through the program that we've gone through. Um, interestingly here is just kind of what was the average score divided by the HP2 cost of the 163 projects? 10.7 and then a total of 3.2 billion uh, that we are advancing in total project cost. And I think the, the big takeaway from this slide, um, at least for me, was you know there was $1.7 billion available um, through House Bill 2, through Smart Scale. Um, but because folks were bringing money to the table, we were actually were able to program uh, quite a significant amount more than that in total projects getting added to the six-year program. And this is uh, further broken out by district, the number of projects, the amount of funding between the high priority and the district grant programs each. So just a good summary of where, where we ended up in this update of the program. As we went through this process, many of you all are aware, we kind of kicked off some lessons learned activities. We um, conducted through all last fall an external review group. We included members of VACO, VML, and VTA, and then um, uh, Smart Solutions, a, a kind of a think tank, to give us some feedback. And so they kind of looked over our shoulder at how we were developing things, looked at the results of the scores. And so we've got some feedback from them. We also conducted both an internal and external survey. Uh, that focus, though, was on the application intake process, screening and validation. We initiated that before the scores were released. We also conducted regional workshops that included our um, OIP, DRPT, and VDOT staff, uh, where we really wanted to focus on all aspects of the process and look at where we could um, gather lessons learned and, and seek some opportunities for improvement. So the external review group. They gave us a little bit of feedback and suggested that we needed to consider an approach that would help um, avoid any low-cost bias. We did see uh, that there was an advantage to low-cost projects. Um, the lower the cost, 
relative to the Venice seem to do very well this year. And um, looking at that. Also to look at how to modify the accessibility measure so that it would actually include uh, non-work accessibility. They also provided uh, feedback um, or suggested that we need to provide additional feedback to the applicants so that we can improve the quality of the applications in future rounds. And the, their conclusion was that we were transparent and that we made a lot of information available and that, you know, we worked hard to make sure that it was understandable by everybody. So we, we did receive some solid feedback from them. So with the stakeholder surveys, um, external survey, we received 114 responses. Um, internally, we received about 84 responses. Um, so again, this feedback, the objective was to, to gather those lessons learned and try to improve the process. So with those results, we did get some really good feedback uh, with the application timing. Many of the respondents indicated that one of the most difficult parts of the process this past for round one was the time period given to complete all the required uh, collaboration, application preparation, and submission. Uh, process consistency was the second one. Uh, so in addition to the timing, the other frequently mentioned part that challenged our district staff was changing rules, process, and guidelines as, as we de further develop the process. Uh, for data and documentation collection, many respondents indicated that it was hard for them to uh, process all the data um, and pull things together that were needed for the application. Um, time and staffing requirements. Uh, it was a lot of time for everybody to collect and gather the data, travel and attend training sessions, and understand um, all the material. And this was obviously on top of everybody's day-to-day -day jobs. And then economic development was an area where uh, there was some challenges um, trying to understand and estimate the future economic benefit. We also had to comment that uh, there was concern about the ability to compete against other jurisdictions, especially if they had other local funding sources. But we also had a lot of successes in addition to the challenges. So we were um, VDOT and DRPT staff were praised for their assistance, um, that especially relative to the short time frame, a uh, lot of assistance, and it was over and beyond um, helpful. The outreach and training uh, was also uh, identified as a success in that we were um, very helpful in providing help and outreach and training. Several district staff were specifically mentioned by applicants as being easy to work with, helpful, reassuring, and quick responding. Um, with our online application tool, several praised that the, uh, sorry about that. Uh, for whatever reason, the screen we're seeing is not, not refreshing. Connection with GoToMeeting server has been lost. Please check your network connection. <laughs> Can everybody still hear us? Yeah. Yes, we yeah. can. It's looking like the um the PowerPoint's not advancing to the subsequent slides. Because at least what I'm seeing on my screen is still the previous slide on challenges. Is that what y'all are seeing? Yes. Okay. Yes. All right. Give it. Give us a minute or two here to try to figure out what's going on. All right. Looks like we're looks like we're back up and running. All right, sorry about that, everybody. Um, so I think I stopped at the application tool, just that it was very helpful, it was user friendly, it was a great job of making use of technology for ease of use. Um, the ability to save work and resume at a later time without losing data or time was uh, very beneficial. And then identif everybody identified, or many um, identified that the objectivity uh, was really helpful. It was an attempt to level the playing field in terms of transportation projects across the state, and I thought that that really was um, very good. Advance my slide. There we go. 
So a couple of areas for improvement that were identified. Um, this was mostly through our own internal resources um, that we needed to update and improve the clarity of both our policy guide and FAQs and potentially add some tutorials and, and example projects that everybody thought that would be very helpful. That the pre-application training and coordination that we just needed to start now, and I think you all have been hearing that message from um, many of us, developing train the trainer materials on the process to ensure consistent guidance statewide, providing clear direction on the application requirements, making sure that projects are ready before proceeding with applications. Um, it was also recommended that maybe we consider uh, completion, a requirement to complete the pre-application form. For validation and screening, uh, we wanted to better define the criteria for meeting a VTRAN need and the project type eligibility. And then with evaluation and scoring, we felt like we needed some better definitions of the inputs such as mixed use, uh, land use, and economic development impacts. Um, also considering maybe tiers of projects based on size. Um, Again, so that it may be a term lane project not competing against the mega project. Maybe this gets a little bit to the factor. So with that said, we did take some of those uh, recommendations and lessons learned, and we've made recommendations to improve the application process. So I'm going to let Chad take over for a little while here now and start talking through some of the proposed improvements. All right, so one of the things I would encourage everybody to consider as we move forward and start to enter the round two process is, you know, working on your applications as early as possible. Consider filling out or completing a pre-application form. The chart here on the screen really illustrates um, the challenge we had as far as in the last week or two, a significant number of the projects in the last two weeks of the applications were created for the first time. Um, the sooner you get the information in, the sooner we're able to start collecting some of the inputs and data that we'll need for the evaluation. Because we've got a relatively short window there of about three months to do all the analysis for all the um, projects that are submitted. So the sooner we have a heads up on the projects that are coming, uh, the better off it'll be. So one of the things we're going to implement for this year is um, encouraging folks that by August 15th, so that would be two weeks after the application cycle starts and you're able to log into the web application, um, there will be key fields highlighted on the application form. And I want to say it's around eight or nine fields, project description, point of contact, really basic information, uh, and have that filled in by the 15th. And folks that do that are going to sort of get first divvy on any technical assistance or we'll get priority on technical assistance from VDOT and DRPT staff and assisting you with things like cost estimates, so on and so forth. Um, so it's not required, um, but hopefully it will encourage folks to at least start their applications earlier on. It will give us a little bit more time to work through some of the data collection and all needed. Um, the administrative process, so what this is getting into, um, because we're just now getting through with round one, there's some things from a policy standpoint that we needed the board to take action on, uh, more on the administrative side of things. So one of the things a lot of folks took advantage of uh, in the first round was bringing sort of matching funds to the table. Um, and we certainly want to continue to encourage that, but there will be some additional documentation uh, that you'll need to provide with respect to the availability of those funds. Uh, the other thing is what happens if the cost estimate for that project goes up after it's selected and goes into the six-year improvement program. You know, what happens if the cost estimate exceeds the scales set forth in the policy? And so what we needed was for the board to sort of take action on what is going to be the policy. Um, and so what we've done is we've clarified that if the cost estimate goes up at either advertisement or the award, and it exceeds those thresholds, those percentage thresholds outlined in the policy guide, um, this sort of lays out what will what will occur. So if the, if the project exceeds those thresholds, we reassess the scoring, and it still scores higher than the lowest funded project, then it would continue to move forward uh, for that particular district. Um, if the, the benefit divided by cost score is lower, then we would take it to the board for form, formal action. We would ask them, what, what do you want us to do with this particular project? Should we continue to re retain funding 
uh, and, and backfill the shortfall, you know, and the board would essentially take action on what to do in the event the score drops below the lowest scoring project that was funded in that particular round that it was evaluated in. So that's just more on the administrative side as far as clarifying, you know, um, additional documentation for matching funds, and then what are we going to do when the when the cost estimate, if the cost estimate were to go up for a particular project uh, after it's funded in, in the six-year program. Now on the, the factor areas, so this is getting into the six factor areas um, where there are measures that are used to actually score the projects, and there's some recommendations, some, some minor tweaks, if you will, uh, on how each of those will work. And so the first one you see here on the screen is related to the environmental factor. Uh, this is one that was presented to the board on multiple occasions over the last several months uh, and was a problematic measure in that you had a number of projects that got a significant amount of points from this, but it was the only factor or the only measure that it got points from. So the project wasn't providing any congestion relief or safety. It wasn't enhancing accessibility or economic development. It just happened to not be in proximity to a sensitive environmental area. Um, and so what we're going to do here and what we presented to the board um, that they will um, likely take action on next month would be this would be the way this measure would work is if you have a low or no potential for impact, then you it would derive its points from the benefits it, it's providing in the other factor areas. So if you had an air, a project that had no or low environmental impact but wasn't getting any score anywhere else, you would essentially be applying a percentage to a very low score and it would not derive that many points. Conversely, if a project is providing congestion benefits and safety benefits, so on and so forth, and also has a low potential for environmental impact, then it would be deriving more points from this particular um, measure. So it's really turning the environment, environmental measure into more of a scaling measure, uh, if you will. Uh, under economic development, um, there was in round one, there was not a connection between the type of project and really the, the potential for that project to influence economic development. Um, so let's say like a road lighting project, you know, how much is a road lighting project going to really benefit? Uh, economic development for a site that's four miles away. So the economic development factor is really an area where we saw we need to have some clear rules with respect to what sites qualify and what buffer you can you can claim or how far away from the project site depending on the project type. Um, another item uh, here was zoned only properties. Um, you know you may have had a zoning that took place 30 years ago and there hasn't been any development on that particular site, and so um, that particular point that the project gets, if it's zoned only, uh, would go away. So this is um, these are some enhancements we feel will will level the playing field, if you will, and provide a little bit clarity on um, the types of sites you can take credit for and the buffer or distance from which the project you can take credit for. So something like an interchange improvement or a rail transit station would have a larger buffer than, say, like a sidewalk project or what have you. So this way, hopefully, the results will make a little bit more sense um, down the road. The other area under economic development relates to the reliability. Um, this is where we use the buffer time index. That's an indicator of variability in travel time and where you have unreliable travel times occurring. And uh, unfortunately, the data set that we use relies on probe data from smartphones and GPS units. And so there are certain lower volume corridors where the, the NRICS data set does not provide coverage. Um, so in the, in the case that that occurred and we could not get that measure from the NRICS data set, we would take a nearby route and apply it. And that did result in some questionable reliability um, uh, measures at the end when you had some really, really low volume um, uh, routes that were getting a, a fairly sizable reliability score. Uh, so the, the, the recommendation to the board moving forward is if there's not enough probe vehicles in the NRICS data set to provide coverage and to be able to calculate a buffer time index, then the, the 
safe assumption would probably be that that's probably a fairly reliable corridor and hence would not get any points under this particular measure. Um, the other issue um, under one of the economic development measures related to the intermodal access, um, this, the project gets points based on certain things, you know, proximity to distribution centers, um, proximity to airports, so on and so forth, is it on an STA truck route? And then we scale those points by the tonnage, um, and this comes from a, a data set we have access to here called TransSearch. Um, the issue there in round one is for like ramp improvements, uh, cross street improvements on interstate facilities, we often were applying the mainline tonnage, uh, and that led to some questionable results for some projects that say we're just doing a minor ramp improvement. Um, so moving forward, the recommendation would be to adjust the tonnage based on the volume that's actually using that ramp as opposed to taking the entire tonnage from the main line. So you would just look at how many trunks, trucks are using that route and what is that proportion to the main line truck volume and then you would scale the tonnage accordingly. And we feel like that would, would yield much more reasonable results for the intermodal access. All right, under safety, um, in round one, the decision was to focus on fatal and severe injury only crashes. Uh, and really that represents about 7% of the total crashes statewide. They tend to be very random in nature. Um, and so one of the things that our recommendation of the board as it stands now would be to look at all fatal or fatal and all injury crashes um, and then apply the weighting that's um, used at the federal level. So uh, fatalities are rated much higher, weighted much higher than severe injuries. Severe injuries is rated, weighted higher than moderate injuries, so on and so forth. Uh, and this is consistent with what a lot of states and DOTs and MPOs throughout the nation are doing, uh, is using this equivalent property damage only scale. Uh, the one difference here is we're actually not going to count property damage only crashes. Um, as part of the safety calculation. Uh, so besides that, it would still be the same. We, we then look at what the project's doing uh, and apply a crash modification factor to estimate how the frequency is going to, how many crashes are we going to avoid and how is the rate going to decrease based on the project features. Um, under the land use measure, um, currently the, the, the points from the application uh, the broad project supporting mixed-use bike walk-friendly uh, development. Um, there's an access management plan in place, so on and so forth. Those points are scaled by the population and employment density uh, in the year 2025 in and around uh, the project. Um, one of the things we, we thought would be important in addition to looking at the density is also look at the plan increase or growth in density over the next 10 years between today and 2025 and that that should factor into the calculation. Um, so that's one of the recommendations would be not only look at the density but how is the density going to grow between now and then um, so that you're, you're giving some points for sort of emerging areas, um, uh, emerging activity centers from an employment and um, you know, uh, population growth standpoint throughout, throughout Virginia. Um, and then the last one here under the factor areas um, really relates to uh, rail transit projects. The, the issue we ran up against in round one <clears throat> was in order to provide additional rolling stock capacity, often you first have to make improvements to the transit station itself, uh, widening the platform and so, so on and so forth so that you can then invest and provide the rolling stock capacity extension. Um, but because the project was only making improvements to the station and didn't also include um, the rolling stock capacity for round one, it did not get any safety, I'm sorry, it did not get any um, congestion benefits or safety benefits. Uh, the thought being you're not pulling traffic from, from the roadway. Um, the problem is you can't have one before you have the other. You have to have the station improvements in place before you can invest in the rolling stock. So the thought here would be you would analyze it as a full package, um, but you would only take the, the percentage of the project cost for this, the, the, like the platform extension, and you would apply that to the benefit. So if the 
platform extension was 10% of the project cost, you'd calculate the benefits with the rolling stock, um, and then you would take 10% of those benefits and apply it. Um, so this will help um, those situations where you have to have like a VRE station improvement before you can even expand the, the, the service capacity. Um, and I think it will be a way to fairly allow those to, to show some benefit. Now, um, one of the things, and this is for both VDOT and DRPT, you know, we can assist you uh, the sooner you come and, and, and talk about your project ideas and all, the more that we'll be able to assist you with respect to um, looking at that project and looking for innovative ways that we may be able to um, value engineer it essentially prior to the application submittal. You know, um, you may, you may you know, 100% of the project cost, 100% of the benefit, but you can do an improvement that may be 50% of that cost, but also gets you 85% of the benefit um, of, the, of the really expensive project. And so really we're encouraging folks to take a look at their projects and try to size them accordingly. And the reason being is that project cost at the end has such a tremendous impact on the end score. Um, and so the sooner you work with, with either VDOT or, or DRPT staff, we may be able to provide you some assistance and some ideas on how you could um, rescope the project and get a lot of the original benefit um, at, at a much lower cost and actually the project would score better at the end. All right, so um, the, the online application, we're going to go through some uh, some screenshots here, but at the end, we're actually going to allow Lindsay to give you all more of a hands-on demo of what we've been doing with the web app. We've got a lot of positive feedback on it with respect to its ease of use and ability to sort of manage the, the application portfolio. Um, so a lot of improvements are being made right now on that tool. Uh, one of the things we heard from the outreach was, hey, this would really be a cool way to submit applications for a lot of the funding programs like revenue sharing, TAP, HSIP, and, and um, you know, a lot of the leadership here felt the same way, that, that that's a, really the way we should go uh, as, a, as, a, as a state and we should, you know, have an online application tool to be able to manage um, applications for all sorts of different programs. So this is what, um, if you submitted an, a House Bill 2 or HB2 application, um, this was sort of the, the screen you would come to and be able to sign in um, with your login credentials. And this is just giving you a feel for where we're taking the application portal. So um, right now you're seeing what we're monitoring the project portal. We're still working on the, the branding for this actual portal. But you'll be able to go in here and manage your applications for multiple programs. So Smart Scale, which is where the HB2 one is now, Revenue Sharing, TAP, the Highway Safety Program. You'll be able to see the number of pending applications that you have in the system as well as the number that you've submitted. Um, we're going to be incorporating a comment and alert feature into the tool. So this will really start to become a, a one-stop shop, if you will, for managing your applications um, to, to VDOT and DRPT for funding. So all your grant requests will be managed in this one system. You'll be able to see which program. So here's just an example of the types of program, you know, what the status of the project is. You'll be able to click on it and go into it, make your edit, submit it, um, you know, unsubmit it, make a, make a tweak. So just very similar to the way the system worked last year. Uh, is, ha is how it will work this year, only you'll be able to submit for multiple programs. Um, one cool feature will be the ability to take an application that you've already created and then apply for another program and it will, the system will automatically import a lot of the common fields between the two applications over, which is going to reduce data entry and streamline things on your, on your side. The other thing is you'll be able to use a previous application from a previous year. So you submitted for a project last year, it wasn't selected, you'd like to um, pull in that information and tweak it for this year, you'll be able to go in and look at a previous application 
and pull all of that data over automatically. In addition to obviously being able to create a new application. <coughs> So this is the, uh, the comment and alert feature that's being integrated in. Uh, and what we're hoping is this is going to streamline the review process. It will document the conversation where, say, you know, a cost estimate needs to be updated. We'll be able to go in the system, put that in as a comment, set it as an alert. You'll be able to see that and then go in and make the change. Uh, and it's all documented within the system. So we're hoping this is going to streamline that collaboration between you and, and the state with respect to as the application is being created and after it's been submitted. The other thing that's being enhanced right now is the mapping. So if you submitted an application last year, one of the things you were asked to do is to go in and draw a polygon around uh, the actual application or around the actual project that you're submitting. Um, and this would tell you, you know, would automatically query out information like, you know, what MPOs and jurisdictions is this project. And this is just an example uh, slide here. Um, but some of the enhanced functionality will be actually selecting VDOT's road layer underneath. And then you would have the ability to go in and cut off segments that aren't part of the project. So if there's a frontage road that's right adjacent that actually inadvertently got selected by the polygon, you would be able to cut that off. Uh, and the real benefit here is going to be more on the ana analysis side. Uh, if we get clean lines that are on our road GIS system coming out of the application, we'll be able to more easily pull traffic data, crash data, so on and so forth. Um, so this is an enhanced functionality that will actually, in, in addition to the polygon, you'll actually be able to tag essentially your project to uh, VDOT's road layer. All right, so kind of going back to just where we are in the process and the cycle, we are beginning for round two. Uh, we will begin a biennial cycle, so we would skip a year so that we can accumulate funding and have a two-year pot of money in which to fund projects for, that are selected for funding. So this is just an updated uh, to reflect that. Um, a few other key changes here just as far as smart scale instead of HV2. And one of the things, though, I wanted to highlight what to expect going forward. Um, we are revising um, some document and guidance documents that were out there last year. We have uh, kind of renamed a couple of things. What was used to be the HP2 Quick Guide will, is becoming what we're naming the Policy Guide and is really focused on the policy and just a high level look at what is HP2 or smart scale in the process, as well as the technical guide. And the technical guide is the HP2 implementation manual that was out there last year. We're uh, just cleaning that up and adding some of the recommendations that you've heard about today. And both of these documents will be out there later this week, and we really want your feedback. There won't be a lot of time, so we're hoping that you will be able to take a look at it and give us any comments on the documents themselves. We're also working on some updated application guidance. So from what we heard with lessons learned is give us some examples of um, some good projects. Um, give me some more how-to. How do I fill out my economic development portion. How do I do something within that online application? So we'll have some enhancements to that area of it. Um, as you've just seen, we're, we're improving the online application tool and making it a one-stop shop. And we'll be providing more information as we move forward through some additional training and outreach opportunities. Uh, we are looking at doing some training that would be specific to each of the grant areas. And um, we'll talk um, on, I've got some scheduled slides coming up. But just so that you all know what to expect, that there will be some additional opportunities to hear more about the enhancements that we've done, um, opportunities to kind of see and feel what the new tool is going to look like. So um, let me go back up. So I've broken the schedule out for the smart scale schedule first. We will post our uh, documents out there for this week for public comment. We're asking for feedback by July 13th because at the July 20th CTB meeting, they will pass a resolution in support of any changes to the policy. So if you have feedback, we'd like to get that to them so they hear about it as well. Um, we will do some additional training and outreach before we would go live with the new application tool on August 1st. Um, a lot of our target audience at that point would be the organization administrators. 
uh, similar to last year, the, for those of you all that were involved, we did a, a WebEx training event with all of you to kind of show you how to go in and set up your organizations and manage the people that are uh, within your organization who would be creating and submitting applications. So again, we'll have some additional outreach to get you all set for that um, and providing some opportunity and some uh, slide decks to show how to use the online application tool. Um, Round two of the application process for SmartScale begins on August 1st. Um, you know, we did hear that uh, we were challenged last year in late submission of applications. So this year we've implemented um, a deadline of August 15th for a notice of intent to apply. As Chad indicated, this is just not mandatory, but it helps give us a view of what types of applications are out there and the volume, and we can manage workload, and we can also make sure that we provide you the level of assistance that's needed. Um, beginning in September, uh, we've been tasked with bringing to the CTB some recommendations on funding scenarios for the next round. So we'll be having that at the September CTB meeting. Um, September 30th is our deadline. So similar to last year, we'll be wrapping up all the application submission period on September 30th. Uh, Chad highlighted that we'll have this kind of comment and send alerts throughout the application cycle. So this will give some ability to give you all feedback as you're developing your application. We'll be doing our round two analysis and scoring from October to January, and then January to June, very similar to the past year, just doing the, the project selection and programming. So with the other programs, uh, we are looking at, through July and August, doing some more training and outreach. I talked about it being more specific to each of the program areas. So from the TAP program, they are planning some workshops and we'll um, be sending out some information about that, and that'll include an overview of the new application and the process during those sessions. You can visit their website uh, for more information, and I do have some link um, resource page here with some links to those different resources. Uh, for the, both the TA and the revenue sharing, um, LAD will announce the application cycle uh, beginning in August, and they'll share the application form um, you just won't be able to actually enter your application until September 1st. So beginning on September 1, the online application tool will be available to submit your applications for the revenue sharing, TAP, and safety programs. Um, so, but you can begin your coordination with those applications right now. So feel free to reach out to your district points of contact for those different programs and start working on those applications. Um, their analysis and scoring will be done from November, November to February and February to June, working on the project selection and programming. So here's just a resource page for you all. And again, this stuff uh, will be posted on our website. Um, just to note that just as of today, we have updated the HP2, uh, VirginiaHP2.org, and it's actually now VirginiaSmartScale.org. So uh, right now, both of them get them to get you there, but uh, the new branding of Virginia Smart Scale is, is out there and available. Right. So the next piece of this is to move to the um, right. apparently I hit on one of the links and I went straight there, so that's good. <laughs> so anyway, it's been branded with the scale the, the um, information. So let me go back to the presentation. There we go. Sorry. That wasn't what I meant to hit. So we're going to transition over to the demonstration of the kind of a prototype of the online application tool. But before we do that, are there any questions for, for me and Chad or anybody else in the group here? All right, Lindsay, can we turn it over to you? Can we turn it over to you? We have a question. Okay. What's the question? I'll have to tell from here. Huh? I'll have to get to come over here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Are you, can you hear me okay? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Great, because um, when here we had to kind of set things up a little bit odd, so I had to have the person come over. Go ahead, Chessa. Hey, Chad. It's Chessa with Chesterfield County. Um, a couple of quick questions. Um, Nick Donahue presented at the CTB meeting on May about a potential resiliency factor that you guys were working through. Is that something, it wasn't presented in detail in the June meeting, so I'm wondering, is that something that's still going to be coming out? 
I, I believe the game plan for now is going to be to do something for round three. Okay. Cool. Yeah, so for round two, I don't think we're going to be incorporating a resiliency measure. Okay, that's fine. Um, and also, um, you mentioned that in the next steps in the schedule that there would be a recommendation to um, the city or, yeah, on the funding scenarios. Is there opportunity for the localities to submit comments then too? I think I, that was on the slide there. Yes. Yes. I'll go back up. I'll go back up. Yeah. The one pre yeah. So right here. Right. Yeah, yeah. Sure you do that. You'll be able to provide comments through the website. So that's fine if you all want to. I know that we did receive some feedback from certain localities or MPOs. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. Be looking at that as yeah, we, I know that the MPOs have supplied. Okay, oh, good. Yeah. So that's already in there then. And then lastly, the draft guide that you provided a link to, that draft guide has been updated to reflect the changes in the scoring measures that you guys presented today? It's not publicly available yet. It should be out there in the next couple of days. Okay, cool. Awesome. The website Thank you. Will be refreshed. Thanks, Chessa. Any other questions? Yeah, Margie, we were wondering, um, when you go through and do the normalization process for the project, are you going to do it by tiers of the projects or just overall projects? It would it would be like in round one, it would be overall. Uh, that is some, some feedback that we got, you know, sort of grouping projects, the really large projects together, and you would normalize just on those projects. Um, but there, there's a reluctance, given how well round one got and how much positive feedback we've gotten on round one, we didn't want to break what isn't broke. You know what I'm saying? It's so. A lot of the enhancements we're, we're recommending are relatively minor in the grand scheme of things. Um, and we felt like that tiering approach would really be a diversion away from the way we did it in round one. And there just wasn't comfort there to support that this round. OK, thank you. Any other questions? All right, then we'll go ahead and transition it to Worldview and Lindsay and let her walk through the, the demonstration. And certainly, if there are questions after she does the demonstration, we're welcome to, to take more questions, or you're welcome to submit them. Um, do I need to do anything, Lindsay, to turn the controls back over to you? I don't think so. I'm doing it right now. Let's see here. <laughs> Margie, can you see my screen now? Yes. The right screen. <laughs> yes, correct. Great. Um, so, like Marty said, my name is Lindsay Duncan. I'm the project manager for Worldview, who's uh, building out the application this year, as well as the application from last year. Um, and I apologize. I'm sitting on my desk, so um, I apologize right now for any background noise that you might hear. Um, so, Margie asked me to step through the prototype. Um, for the application. And this is the um, tool that we've been using to help develop the site, get feedback from our stakeholders on um, how it should be built. So um, I need to sort of put a disclaimer on here that this is not the actual application. Um, it is interactive. So when I click, things will happen. But essentially, they're screenshots. This is a mock-up. Um, so the look and feel of this may change by the time it gets around to you guys. Um, so you're going to have your login page um, pretty straightforward. You'll get a username and password. Um, once you log into the site, it will take you to this landing page that Chad showed earlier with all the programs that you're um, eligible to apply for. Um, on each of these sort of blocks for each of the programs, you'll be able to get a little bit more information. We have about pages set up for each of those uh, programs. You can get to that website. Um, you can start an application or view applications that you've already started or have submitted. Um, along with this page, uh, as Chad also said, 
We've got these sections for alerts and comments for you to communicate with um, the districts to help coordinate on getting your applications complete. And these are going to be organized by program. And then you'll have a little uh, sort of number count of how many alerts or comments that are outstanding or need your attention. So that's the main page. Up on the top here in the header, you'll be able to start a new application. And if I click there, it might go. So as Chad showed you also, you can choose your program that you'd like to apply for. You can use a previous application. So you could um, take an application from last year's HB2 and clone the information over and start it again. Um, there's some filters on here. And then the other option on this page is to just create a brand new application where you choose um, some stuff to get started with and then start your application. Um, next on the header, you have what we're calling a dashboard. And this is where you're going to be able to keep track of all of the applications that you either have in progress or have submitted. Um, so we've got some information sort of in this grid here, your organization, the status, any comments that are related to that application. You'll also be able to prioritize your apps from this page, where ideally, and the functionality is not in here, but you could sort of just shift these things around into a different order, hit save, and then um, per organization, your applications would be saved in the order that you would prefer them to be in. You can also start a new application from this dashboard page as well. Um, and then next on the headers, you've got all of the about pages that um, are referenced on the landing page. So if I clicked on the the HB2 or what's now SmartScale um, about page. You've got some text about the program and then um, VDOT representatives that you might be able to get in touch with for assistance as well as DOPRT. Um, along with the comments and alerts that were on the home page, you've also got sort of a real brief um, little button up here, just a quick access to see how many comments and alerts you've got pending. You can view them all, and they should be in order by program as well. Um, and then the last thing on the header is sort of an organization um, account information section. Let me close this guy. Where you can, of course, start a new application. There's multiple places you can do that. Um, and then you can view information about your account. If you are an organization administer, administrator, you can um, set up users and um, that sort of thing there. And there's a preview of that page. I'm not going to go into very much detail about that. But you can add users and um, set up their roles and, and rules about that user in particular. So um, once you have started a new application, so you can do it here or in any of the other places that you could potentially start an application, um, this should look familiar from last year. We've got the Perl sort of uh, stepping you through the application. Um, so that should be the same. Uh, this year, we've, we're going to incorporate some help text into a lot of the fields along inside of the application. So this sort of I button, that's not mocked up yet. but a little pop-up box should, um, should appear with some help text. Um, and then this is the, uh, the big change is the comment. So on each of these uh, pearls up here, you'll have a section down at the bottom related to comments. And they are organized by field name. So each of the fields on this screen will have a different section in the comments so that um, while you're uh, coordinating with each other, you can sort of relate it to a section in the application. And these comments are ordered by um, when they come in. They get a date stamp, a time stamp, and who actually submitted the comment so you know who it came from. So it's pretty much just a rolling um, way to keep track of, of um, changes and suggestions to complete your applications. To add a comment, you would select the field that you want, type your comment, hit add, and it would get populated up here.
So then moving through the application, the next tab would be your location tab, or Perl, sorry. Um, and Chad also showed you this. This is going to be an enhancement from last year, this map. Um, we've added this sort of uh, window here that comes in and out to give you a little more real estate on the map. Um, it's sort of standard mapping tools, your zoom in, zoom out. You have an identify button. You can make selections with a pointer or with a marquee, sort of select an area. We've got an address search built in so that you can find your areas on the map easier. Um, and you can change the base maps to streets or aerials or a hybrid of both. Down at the bottom is a small legend so that you can hopefully keep track of what you're showing on the screen. And then, of course, sources down at the bottom here. So to move through the map, this should be sort of similar. You're going to add your project area. You're going to draw the project area. You'll have the options to edit your project area with these vertices here. You can remove it or you can zoom to it. And this gives you the um, ability to add multiple project areas. So you'd have area one, area two, um, in case your project is a disjointed um, two area project. So along with what Chad was saying um, about selecting the roads, you would be able to, um, once you've drawn your project area, the road segments are automatically selected. And then a list of all those road segments will appear in this window off to the left. Uh, if you hit the Identify button, it will pull up information about the route. You can exclude it from your project area from this little window. So see how this guy has turned red. Um, or you can select it using the, uh, these buttons up here and just click on the route itself to deselect it. You could also check on and off over here. So multiple ways, and we're still working out the details about that. So that may change a little bit, but the functionality um, is uh, pretty much you can select segments or deselect your segments and exclude them from your project. So that's the roads and highways. And then the next four sort of show how you can um, put your uh, justifications that are related to your VTRANS needs um, in the application here. So um, just for example, you've got your uh, corridor statewide significance here, regional network, safety, or urban development areas, which all sort of function the same way. But say I wanted to um, say my project affected this uh, corridor of statewide significance, I would be able to edit my justification for why my project would um, benefit that or affect that, hit save, and it would be saved into the form. You can also do the same thing uh, as you did with the VDOT road segments, excluding that from the project area. Um, and these are just mocked up. Obviously, these are <laughs> these regions are not all going to be right here, but um, they're just showing different types of geography. And like the um, the map last year, it will pull the underlying geographic data, such as PDCs and that sort of thing, county, into your um, application. So. Um, I think that's pretty much it. Yep, I showed you the organization administration. That was just a real quick run through of the um, prototype. And we'll probably make some changes to this um, as we move forward and move along in the development of the application. Um, but we're working very closely with Margie and Chad and um, all of the other programs, program administrators, to get um, them incorporated into this project portal, which I believe is going to have a different name as well. So I think that's it for me, Margie. OK, great. Um, Chad, did you want to make a comment about the mapping? Well, just the, the functionality that Lindsay just showed with respect to um, being able to see your, your project in proximity to the VTRANS needs assessment. Uh, one of the things, if you, if you submitted in round one, you know, as part of the screening process, the project was evaluated as to whether or not it was meeting a VTRANS need on a quarter statewide significance. Uh, regional network, UDA, or safety. And um, we, we did get quite a bit of feedback from the external survey that it wasn't always easy to sort of make that connection and so on and so forth. 
So I think this, this enhancement here was really based on some of that feedback we were getting of how can we make it easier for you to see the applicable or potential uh, VTRANS needs and proximity to the to the project and be able to m more easily make that connection and, and document why you think the project's addressing a need. So this would be specific to the to the smart scale or the HP2 project submission. And maybe you said this, Chad, and I just missed it, but the, the actual VTRANS needs that um, have already been identified will be included in this. So you will have that drop-down box for the selection to select the needs that have already been identified. So it's not something new. It's what is already yeah. existing. Yeah, I think last year the VTRANS needs were out as PDFs on the VTRANS website. And so it was sort of fell upon the applicant to then cross-reference and read through all the needs and make that connection. And this, I think, will make it a lot easier to see the, the connection and, and, and document that. And Lindsay, can you go back to the organization administration screen? Sure. So I, I mentioned just a little while ago um, about um, how we would have to do some more outreach on the organization administration. Um, it's our thought that for this year with managing multiple grant programs and application submission that we would still want to have a single entity for each eligible applicant to manage the organization and the permissions within that organization. So when we go out for the outreach, and uh, we'll be contacting those that already had an org ad, um, admin account from last year for the HB2, but then having to identify and make sure that we're getting the right person set up in the system as the org administrator for this year. Um, VDOT, uh, like at the di district level, will actually be managing the permissions at the district level, so the people that you all may be coordinating with at the districts will kind of all be working together very closely on making sure that we've got the right people involved in looking at the projects. Um, but that outreach and training will be coming in July. All right, so there's the demonstration. Um, and, and so that really kind of wraps up what we wanted to share with you all today. So again, more questions. Um, before you all ask them. If you all have other questions, feel free to send them to, to me or Chad. The original email that uh, Russ Dudley sent out to you all included our contact info. You also have your district points of contact, which are a tremendous resource for you all. And then there is, through the uh, SmartScale website, there's also the ability to send us emails through that system, and, and that's a mailbox that's monitored daily. So we can always make sure the right person's answering the question. So there's certainly multiple ways to reach out to us if we haven't answered your question or you think of something later. Um, but let me open the, the floor up for more questions if anybody has anything. Well, hopefully that. Hopefully it means we haven't overwhelmed you, and um, we're excited about some of the changes, and we'll continue to, to share with our, our district points of contact so that they also are in the know of what we've got going on, and um, feel free to contact us. So I'll give it a, another minute if anybody has any questions, but otherwise, really appreciate everybody's time today. Lindsay, thank you very much for walking us through and setting up the go-to minute at, last, for the, at the last minute. And, uh, no problem. Margie, I wanted to mention I, I hit the record button shortly after you mentioned it wasn't going to be recorded, so um, I can send that to you and we can see if that works for the Fantastic. presentation. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yep. Mm -hmm. And looking around the room here, too, anybody have any comments or anything they want to add? All right. Thank you all very much, and we'll be in touch soon.